ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Beverly Anderson, Head of Consumer Financial Services for Wells Fargo Bank. Good afternoon, everyone. You always know you're at a great event when everybody's up and talking and mingling and making uh, new relationships and networking. Uh, but I have a really awesome next phase of the program, so I'd love to, uh, love to have us get started. Great, thank you, thank you all. So I'm very privileged to be here today uh, and to introduce and host our special guest, Ed Gilligan, with American Express. Our theme of our session of this program is called New Frontiers. And certainly in financial services, we are experiencing uh, and exploring a number of new frontiers in the space of payments. The driving force, of course, is the new digital technologies I'm sure you've spent some time talking about today, the smartphone, uh, and new entrance to payments. And the smartphone itself, it's becoming such a transformative uh, device. It's the screen of choice for our customers that it's transforming the space that we all live in every day. Our goal today is to talk about how some of these new and disruptive technologies are creating opportunities and challenges for us in financial services, uh, and to talk about new and emerging payment platforms. Ed Gilligan uh, and American Express are certainly one of the leaders in the industry when it comes to thinking about how digital technologies and payments are intersecting and in some cases colliding. Has anybody here experienced Apple Pay and is anybody starting to pay with their watch? Right, it's pretty amazing. Ed has been with American Express for over 30 years and in his time there he's led multiple business units both in the US and internationally. And he was named as president in 2013. Ed has led his teams on some of the most advanced and innovative use of digital platforms uh, from social media to creating new programs such as Small Business Saturday, which brings customers and merchants together. I personally watched Ed at American Express reach three down, three layers down in an organization and grab a team of people and personally drive some of the digital transformation that you've seen at Amex. You may not know this, but Wells Fargo, where I work today, and American Express have a very special relationship. We were founded by the same founders back in the 1850s, and on and off over the last 160 years, we have shared a very special relationship, including the one we launched recently in 2014, a strategic partnership to bring amazing Wells Fargo American Express cards to our Wells Fargo customers. I've known Ed for many years. I've seen him transform and be the most forward-thinking leader in the industry of, of payments. And please welcome Ed Gilligan to the stage at this point. So I have to admit that Ed and I have done this before. Uh, we were at a leadership conference about a year ago, so this seems to be our gig. Uh, Not so, a bad gig. So we're very excited to be, to be here. And I want to start with a question of relevance. Mm -hmm. um, as we know in today's time, and I'm just looking at some of the logos uh, scrolling, scrolling on the screen, that when a company gets to be 10, 20, or even 30 years old these days, it feels like an old company. Yeah. So here we are, American Express is 160 years old. How does it remain relevant in today's uh, changing times? It's a great question, and it's a great kind of uh, objective that we have, is how do you stay relevant when so many things are changing? And in fact, to be 160 years old, a company like Amex has had to transform many times in its history. And we're at one of those times again. I think all of us who are living at the intersection of, say, traditional financial services and new technology have to change. And it's, it's a lot of fun to see how the change involves. But I think for Amex, it starts with trying to make sure we understand who we really are as a company. And the way we talk about ourselves is at our core, we're a service company. Right, that's how we view it. We're here to help our customers, help the merchants who accept the card, try to take friction out, try to do, help, help uh, merchants do more business, which is why we created Small Business Saturday four year, uh, five years ago. But we're, tr we're trying to find ways to service our customers better and use that to differentiate. Uh, 
And we do have a unique business model. You know, when I do come, I come out to this part of the world often, and we work with a lot of the new companies that are that are just forming in the space, uh, including this afternoon meeting with a company like Stripe or Square or Twitter later today or Apple uh, and Google uh, tomorrow and companies like that, all who are thinking about payments. And when we talk to the, to these companies, we try to explain American Express is a little bit different. In fact, you know, we have an integrated payments platform, which means we have the relationship with the card member, we have the relationship with the merchant, we run a network that connects them, but as a result, we, ha we kind of control our own ecosystem. And I know, uh, Bev, you know this well. And in payments, you know, that's the moral equivalent of, say, what Apple has in, uh, with phones, right? They own the hardware, own the software, obsess over customer experience. They don't have as much volume around the world as, say, Android does, but they can control their experience. Amex doesn't have as much volume in our network as, say, Visa has, but Visa doesn't own the, the, the card member relationship or the merchant, and we do. So we have a unique business model, and our goal is to stay relevant when so many things are changing, which is why this is such a unique period of time. And it's really not technology-driven. It's, it's driven by changes in consumer behavior that every one of you are sitting here are now sitting connected to the internet, probably checking your email now or looking at your Instagram posts, you know, having billions of apps downloaded. How that's impacting us is the way you shop, buy, and pay for things has changed radically, and we're only in the very early stages. It will continue to change radically over the next three or four years on, on how commerce is conducted. And the only way American Express can continue to be a growth company is if we transform and stay relevant by staying close to our customers, our partners, merchants who accept our card, and making sure we're adding value when so many other things are changing. It's fun, Bev. This is a, <laughs> this is a fun uh, period of time. You know, it's a little nerve-wracking as well. And we said it's, it's really good, you know, to be, to be a little paranoid when you have lots of new companies some very close to here that are coming that are disrupting payments. So we are, and I, am, I remain to be uh, a little bit paranoid about this, uh, and that's good if you're always looking about what's changing. But what you can't afford to ever be is become paralyzed by that, which I think Amex isn't, and I know Wells Fargo isn't either, right? So we're looking for change, trying to anticipate change, and try to anticipate how can we add new value to our, our customers as your commerce journey changes. So I think that's amazing, and it's, it's just interesting to see how Amex has embraced the change and the disruption. You're spending some time here in Silicon Valley. Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in the space of innovation and uh, new disruptions and emerging technologies. No, it's really interesting. I even started going back four or five years ago when we were trying to understand how social media would impact consumer behavior. And we started doing things with Facebook and Twitter four years ago where you could link your Amex card, but we could use your social graph on Facebook to give you curated offers from merchants that accept American Express. Or you could tweet a hashtag and you could link your card to offers or actually even conduct commerce. We did lots of experiments. Uh, over the last three or four years to say, how do we reach our customers where they are? Which was a big learning from us from the web 1.0 days of uh, the late 90s, early 2000, where we thought we had to build the all-knowing and seeing uh, Amex.com and try to get everyone in the world to come to us. What was different about this phase is let's go where our customers are. Our customers are on Facebook, they're on Twitter, right? They're on Instagram, they're on Pinterest. How do we go down this road to find ways to connect with them and give them a unique experience? All the while, to answer your question now, we keep seeing there's new companies coming up trying to take friction out of payments or trying to you know, curate offers from merchants to help merchants grow their business. And they're coming in at from different angles. And it's really interesting. And we look at this. Generally, we see there are definitely threats to, uh, to the existing players in any industry, as there were in many other things besides financial services. But I keep, every time I look at this, I see because of I, you know, a Amex's unique business model, because I think of the culture we're trying to instill in the company, one, you know, something called a growth mindset, that, is, that was actually co a phrase coined by uh, a professor at Stanford, Carol Dweck, a number of years ago. How do we bring in a growth mindset into the company? So you see a risk, you try to mitigate it, but in every risk you, you identify what are the opportunities. And you know, it's part of the mindset is, 
things are changing and you can decide to try to fight that or have your head in the sand or you can embrace it and say, how do I accelerate this? Because somewhere here there's an opportunity and if I can take advantage of that opportunity faster than my competition can, then I can create a competitive advantage. So we are always kind of of two minds saying, what are the risks from new players? What's the change in the economic model and how consumers buy things? But what's the opportunity for Amex to play a more relevant role in the lives of our customers? And for every risk, I find two or three opportunities. As long as your eyes are open and you're listening and, and you're realizing, uh, even though you know, I can, I've been in Amex a long time, not a day goes by that I'm not learning something new about what we can do to stay more relevant in the future. So Ed, you've said the word risk now a couple of times, and if anybody here in the audience is in the space of payments, you know that we spend a lot of time thinking about risks. And one of the big risks is data security and how do we protect our customers. Um, there's certainly this higher incidence of fraud. We've seen breaches. Companies are spending billions of dollars to protect the customer data, privacy concerns. Do you think we'll ever find a way to forth the fraud that exists in the system, or will we just have to keep trying to find ways to mitigate it over time? No, it's a great question, Beverly. It's, uh, it's funny, I was watching uh, an interview with the former head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff a couple of weeks ago on television, and he was saying two things he worries about. Russia rearming and cybersecurity. Uh, and uh, for good reason. Russia I'm not going to touch on because we don't know where that's going to go, but cybersecurity uh, is uh, a threat that I'm sure most people here will know, but it's every day companies like Wells Fargo and Amex and many other have hundreds if not thousands of attempts to breach our firewalls to get customer data. And a number of the breaches in the last two years have been uh, widely reported. And when you're in a credit card business, you know, we contain lots of information on our customers. And um, we, I think, I don't want to tempt fate, uh, but you know, we, we treat this uh, as our top priority. And I know, I know Wells does as well, working hard to protect our customer data. But we're also at risk because our customer data is in many other places. Every time you leave your card on file at a merchant, an online merchant or a real merchant, it's at risk. And that's where the, in, that's where the breaches are occurring right now in merchants and other places that may not have the security that a financial services company would have. And everyone is working hard to try to, to, to protect that, but there's a lot of stolen credit card numbers uh, out there in the world today. You can go to websites emanating from Eastern Europe and buy any number of cards that you're looking for, and within uh, a few hours you can be up and running with fraudulent card numbers. There's lots of stolen social security information as well. So. Um, and it's, the threats are, used to be coming from just hackers out there somewhere, and now they're coming from nation states or something akin to nation states where governments uh, in different parts of the world you know, are, are allowing uh, this to occur on their home soil. So it's a, it's a major threat, right? And uh, I don't want to go down this road too much, but I think the, the best we can hope for now are finding ways to mitigate it. And I think individually you have to think about where all your information is and you need to safeguard it to the best of your ability. You know, you, you, we're all connected online, all our information is in the cloud, uh, and it's all vulnerable. So you have to think about that. But as companies like we do that, that have a big part of our brand is about protecting our customers and servicing and, in, and integrity and security. That's, a, that's been part of Amex's brand since uh, we founded the company in 1850, but these things were important to us then, and even though everything else has changed, that hasn't, that our customers still expect service, trust, uh, and security from American Express. We have a high bar that we have to live up to. So, I mean, I, I don't think we're gonna find a cure to this, but I do think we're learning every day how to prevent the theft of information. And I, and I honestly, I don't wanna tempt fate, but I, I would tell, say this is one of the biggest issues that will disrupt, say, mobile payments. If you look at the train is leaving the station now with, uh, with Apple Pay, um, with a few more that will be announced, uh, that have already been announced, Samsung has talked about its approach, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's other players. Google has had a payments product for a while. They have their big developer conference next week uh, and probably will talk about this subject. I mean, I do believe mobile payments will scale here dramatically in the next three years. But the only thing that will disrupt that is if somehow uh, information is not as well protected in the minds of customers if it's on your phone versus a piece of plastic in your wallet. 
and quite honestly, a lot of the mobile transactions, the way it's been tokenized and protected, may be more secure. But what's not secure is that there's a lot of stolen identity information out there. So it remains to be seen how acute the situation will be around cybersecurity. Um, uh, it's a big threat, and I know comp both our companies are spending tens of millions, if not more, trying to pr safeguard our customer information. Uh, but it's, it's, it's definitely one of the big risks to the continual evolution of payments. Absolutely. And, um, you know, we always have to talk about those, those real heavy, meaty topics. Uh, let's go back to something a little more fun, like partners. You mentioned Google and Apple and uh, Samsung. How do you think about partners these days? Are they competitors? Are they friends, foe? Well, we, we think a lot about this. If it, we, Amex has a lot of partners, including Wells Fargo, which we're proud of. And we did, Wells Fargo actually founded Amex before they founded <laughs> Wells Fargo when they decided to move from New York out west. They were ahead of the curve back in the, in the 1850s and 1860s. Uh, and Wells Fargo is now a very important partner of American Express and vice versa. So we have partners, you know, we have lots of partners of banks we work with around the world. We have partners with companies who sign merchants to accept American Express cards. We have co-brand partners like Delta Airlines in the U.S. and Starwood Hotels that are great to work with. But increasingly when we talk partners, we're talking about where other platforms, digital platforms, where our customers are, is that we're working with to try to create more value. And I said four years ago, it was launching programs with Facebook uh, and Twitter. Um, it was doing things with TripAdvisor. It was actually working with Microsoft and Xbox a few years ago, thinking about interactive television. But lately, it's, you, know, you see us, we did a lot, and as did, uh, I think, most financial service companies in the US work with Apple. Uh, and you're going to see us continue to work. Just two weeks ago, we announced uh, a mobile payments play with a company called Jawbone. Some of you know. They have speakers, but they produce fitness bands. And starting in the next couple of weeks, you'll be able to buy a fitness band from Jawbone that will track your steps, tell you how well you're sleeping. Uh, but we'll also have a chip in there that you can use your Amex card to just tap and pay when you're out. Uh, uh, you're out for a jog, you can now use your jawbone to, uh, to pay for things, right? <laughs> so uh, at the point of this, the, the, who we partner with are changing radically, but the, we do have some key principles about this, right? So we, when we, we, the same way we thought about Apple, working with Apple two and three years ago, we think about all the new players that come is that first we want to be very careful about the use of information. Because now when you have your card linked to your phone or to your fitness band or, whatever, or to your watch, you know, there's a lot of information floating out there. So we have to make sure we're protecting customer information and that the partner, like Apple, is using it to service but not for other reasons. So protection of, of information has always been critical, and that's a key principle. We look at, is it clear to customers when you use your mobile wallet that you can see who the merchant was so you know if that was your transaction? And in the early days, um, there was a lot of confusion about the business model. So if you use Apple Pay today and you tap and pay with your phone, when you get a statement from Amex or Wells Fargo, you will see who the real merchant is. That, that was a, a big part of the debate a few years ago. Uh, and a number of players um, now are seeing that Apple has chosen a very customer-friendly way to go. And there's always discussions about intellectual property and if we do something, can we protect our own intellectual property, et cetera. So we did establish uh, principles about protection of customer data, about making it, making it easy for customers and clarity on, on the transaction so we wouldn't cause customer service questions and so on. And I have to say, working with Apple, I think they blazed the right trail, uh, and they made a lot of the right decisions. And now I see there's a lot of others following that lead, whether it's Samsung, and you'll see you know, others uh, in the next few weeks talk about their mobile wallet. And I think there's room for multiple players here. But I think getting that model right was critical, and um, I think it's off to a very good start. That's great. And certainly we can't have a conversation about growth and innovation without talking about talent. And I think our audience had a conversation with Chevron just recently about uh, diversity. Um, what kinds of things is American Express doing around diversity and inclusion, gender equity? And certainly that's a topic that's alive and well here in the Silicon Valley and the tech sector. 
Listen, it, and it's a, it's a critical question. You say, what does a 50-something-year-old white guy have to say about diversity, <laughs> right? Um, but I, I can tell you that in American Express, I think the one thing, I've been in American Express my whole career. I started working there. I had to work through college when I was uh, living in New York, and I was hired as a temporary employer you know, there 30-something years later. And one of the things that I loved about Amex then, as I do now, is I felt that I had a chance to prove myself, that, you know, that we were trying to create level playing fields or a meritocracy, right, uh, so that um, people who bring different skills can contribute to a higher levels of potential than they thought. And I do believe we have that culture at American Express. Not perfect, but I think we continue to, to perfect it. And it does start with like the philosophy how we run the company. So I did say we're a service company. We set a very high bar for shareholder results, revenue growth, net income growth, return on equity. We set a very high bar for ourselves. But we know the way to achieve that is through a balanced result. So we also have, as much as we weight shareholder returns and how we evaluate leaders, we focus on customer results. Are we getting not just customer satisfaction, are we getting high net promoter scores? Customers who would promote us to their friends. And we track net promoter scores. But key to getting high net promoter scores from your customers is having a workforce that's highly engaged. right? And how do you get a highly engaged workforce? You have a diverse group of people who feel that they can contribute and make a difference, that the people they work for care about their growth and development, and that we try to get at these inherent biases are there that, that create uh, the perception and reality that, n that not everyone has a fair shot at the next promotion or getting in a, a project that where they can grow and develop. And we work really hard at that. We're incredibly proud of our results on a number of fronts, but we know we have a long way to go. Uh, and a couple of years ago, uh, the, the, our, our head of HR asked me to, to, to uh, sponsor women in the pipeline at American Express. And I'd say in the last three years, we have more than doubled the number of women at very senior positions in the company. And we feel great about that. And we take two or three steps forward. But we take a step backwards every, I don't, and I, and I, I don't, again, it's like with cybersecurity, I don't want to, I want to be a little paranoid and, or tempt fate that I'm always worried about, are we making enough progress fast enough? But we can look over three or four years and say, you know, we're proud of the results we have and we know we have a long way to go. Um, so it's, it's all about creating an environment where people feel they can grow and progress and that they're, they don't have to change who they are to fit in, that the company will evolve to embrace them so they can reach a higher level uh, of potential. And I, I'm a very passionate believer in that, that, you know, that for a company to do well, it's not just about financial results, it's about making an impact. And can, you, can we help the people who work there by giving them a career so they can do things they never thought they could do before? And I feel blessed that I was given that, and my job is to help pay that back now. How can I get others to have that experience that you can do things in your career that you never thought were possible? And that's why I, I do uh, have a lot of, I spend a lot of time and put a lot of uh, uh, passion and energy into, into our diversity efforts and trying to, trying to create strong connections with all the groups of, uh, of people that make up the 60,000 employees of American Express. It makes the job really interesting and much more worthwhile when you can see you've made an impact on someone else's career. Uh, so it is a big part of what we do. And uh, again, it's one of the parts of the job that I love, I love the most is to see that you can make an impact and then maybe you've helped somebody who believed they did not have a level playing field. So how do we blow that up? Uh, and in a very productive way. So, you know, between the digital innovation and, uh, and our efforts on diversity, I mean, I feel great. We have a 165-year-old company, right, that many times feels like we've created a startup, right, and we have that energy. Uh, and which is why I try to spend a lot of time out here to kind of take in the atmosphere here and say, how do we bring that back to a, a company and bring that passion and that commitment? But the focus of, of our experience is say, how you get sustainable results is through a lot of these other efforts that may not have reached the younger companies yet. Do, does a five-year-old company really understand the importance of diversity and how you set goals, right? And how do you create a right, the right environment? Right? And that's some of the advice that we bring to a lot of the companies here, that that stuff is important. And if you want to create sustainable shareholder value, you need that. So we, I love getting new ideas and fresh thinking here, but I also love trying to give advice to those who will listen 
about, you know, it's about balanced results, not just about one part of your performance, it's about balanced results. And the best way to do that is have a workforce that's diverse and fully engaged and feeling they can do more. Uh, and it's, that's, there, is, there is things that 160-year-old companies can impart on the new companies, Beth, and I, I know you know that as well. Absolutely. So, Ed, we didn't have a lot of time today, but thank you so much. And certainly you and American Express have an impact with us as partners, but also in the industry and in the space of payments. So thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, Beth. It's a and pleasure. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you all.